So I came across this article. This is absolutely incredible. Um, why POWH 3D and Ethereum DAP might be a better store of value than Bitcoin. Now this article is, um, I don't know the date of this article, but it's not super recent. I mean, it, oh, there it is. I believe it was April 1st. Okay, so it's not super recent, but it's fascinating. Um, and he articulates some of the things that I've said on my channel before, but he, he writes about it in a way that is far more uh, articulate. So let me just go ahead and read this. Why proof of weak hands and Ethereum debt might be a better store of value than Bitcoin? This article is solely an analysis of the market. This is not trading advice. This is not investment advice. I own a small portion of P3D that I purchased while writing this article. What is a store of value? Now, I want you to keep reading because what he talks about are some of the unique real case scenarios, and it just shows you how cutting edge we are right now. So what is a store of value? Store of value is an objective that we look to put wealth in and pull that wealth out at some point in the future. Throughout history, we've had a number of stores of value, jewelry and precious shells, gold, Bitcoin. Another store of value is insurance. Think about a life insurance policy that pays $100,000 on your death and that you pay $30 a month to be a part of. The value you're storing is $100,000 and what you pay is $30 a, $30 a month of your, uh, of your life. <clears throat> So you buy something that has a $100,000 value at some point in the future, but you pay $30 a month. You pay, that's the key word, $30 a month. Now here's why insurance is cool. It's because it gets together enough other people like you and through the magic of large number is able to share the risk between everyone. So now you and a group of people can also share value through this contract. Even though you haven't stored $100,000 in value, the policy still entitles inheritors to this amount of money. This is actually far more value than just a rock because it allows you to take a small amount of risk and have assurance that at some point in the future, you'll be able to restore more wealth than you put in. Now, here's the fascinating part. This is the assumption. I mean, he doesn't go into this in the article, but this is the assumption about insurance that you ultimately get more money out than you put in. The reality of insurance is insurance companies couldn't exist if that occurred for everybody. The reality of insurance is most people end up putting more money in than they ever get out. Meaning, if, if, if you have a $100,000 life insurance policy, then that policy, the way it's calculated is it's calculated at a certain rate, say a term life policy. You know, it's calculated at a certain rate that people in your demographic, your age group, with your health risk, at, you know, paying X amount of dollars, most of them will pay more than the few who end up taking uh, advantage of the benefit. Or I guess in life insurance, the family would take advantage of the benefit. So the goal is if I need it, I would get more out than I put in. But the reality is you always, on statistics, end up putting more in. It's kind of interesting. I mean, in a lot of ways, insurance can could be, if we were just looking at it objectively, insurance could be classified as a scam because it simply feeds off of your insurance is a bit of a scam. It feeds off of your fears. And the reality is insurance companies are not in the they're not in the business of paying out. I mean, there's so many exclusions on your insurance policies, and it's one of the things that you have to be careful for. If you've ever had to collect on insurance, like I have, even for something like a car wreck, sometimes it can be a pain in the butt just because they don't want to pay you. So let's compare that with Bitcoin. The current thesis of the Bitcoin core community is that Bitcoin is a virtual gold. There's a finite supply of it, and you put money into buying some, wait, and then the same Bitcoin will be worth more than the stuff in the future. Now, the problem with this is that it assumes a market exists of people that will either accept or value Bitcoin in the future. This is assumed because people will value it now. See the circular logic? So because people value it now, there's an assumption they'll value it in the future. And that basically depends on technology and a lot of factors outside of control. That's what he's saying when he says, see the circular logic. A Dutch merchant probably thought the same thing, that these tulip seed will feed my children. I mean, that's a... That's a great analogy. When the market's hot, everybody assumes people will pay that amount in the future. Currently, 16 plus million out of 21 million have been mined. He's talking about Bitcoin. This means that the more than 75% of all the wealth in the future has been allocated. And if you don't have some, we'll all look up to some of the world's richest people. Uh, not Elon Musk, but luminaries like Roger Ver and Luke Dash Jr. Good luck getting most no coiners to accept that. This is a good point. Are the large financial institutions, the people that think cryptocurrency, that, that really for cryptocurrency to go mainstream, one of the most plausible routes is that large financial institutions accept it. But if they don't accept it, people like Roger Ver and Luke Dash are becoming some of the wealthiest people in the world. Um, so are these financial luminaries ever going to, I mean, are these 
financial, sorry, are these financial, you know, no coiners, big corporations, powerhouse, you know, the wealthy elite, whatever in the traditional financial market, are they going to say, oh, you know, they're just going to succumb and be like, oh, you know, these guys are the, the, these are the wealthy now because of, you know, they were early adopters. That's fascinating. That's an argument of egos. Um, I think that argument wins out for a little while unless the mass market ultimately just decides to go with cryptocurrency at some point in the future, which is possible. Now, insurance isn't perfect since the USD, your policy is denominated and may be worthless. However, the system is self-regulating. The insurance policy only takes in what is considered valuable and only pays out what is considered valuable. If it does not fulfill this purpose, people will not use it. So a good insurance contract is actually very adaptable. It merely is a collection of risk, the shelling point that makes a contract valuable. Now, inner pr proof of weak hands 3D. A rapidly rising Ethereum debt fits the traditional definition of a Ponzi scheme with one exception. A Ponzi involves lying about and taking money from late investors and using it to pay back previous investors. This works easily at the beginning, but as the scheme grows, it becomes exponentially more difficult to find new investors. This eventually leads to a collapse in which the later investors start demanding their money back, causing other earlier investors to demand their money, eventually winding up and snarling its creator. This is bad because it because it is lying to people about where their money is going. P3D doesn't lie to anyone. See the source? It works the following way. You buy a token through their contract with ETH, Ethereum. The price of the token goes up by 0.00000000001 ETH every time you buy it. So the first token is, the second token is that price. The 300th token is that price. If there is 50 ETH in the contract, each token is priced at 0.001 ETH. When you sell a token, it pulls from the ETH stored in the contract and it gives it to you at the given price. However, for every token sold, it depresses a price per token the same way it increases it. So if you run the math, you'll notice that there's always enough ETH in the contract to pay everyone out. Now, this is important. Note, everyone might not get the same price to sell as they bought in at. That is the risk associated with the contract. If you've never read this, it's good. So you say this is a pyramid scheme. Yup. Pyramid schemes only repay old investors with new ones. Yup. If the funds from old investors make it back to new investors, it's not a pyramid scheme. That makes sense to me. The proof of weak answer D is not a pyramid scheme. I'm 100% right. It's a pyramid scheme. When you buy a token or sell a token, you pay a 10% fee. That 10% fee is then distributed evenly to all outstanding token holders. These fees can be withdrawn at any time and represents passive income. As a holder of P3D, you get paid for taking the risk of holding onto the token. If you're a long-term hodler, that's jargon for long-term holder. If you're a long-term hodler and don't need to sell the tokens very often, you can collect the passive income. Everyone always gets paid. Now, whether the number is fair is directly proportionate to how much risk they took when they got into the contract in the beginning. Now, why hasn't this ever worked in the past? Well, the problem was that it was run by humans. A human is attempted to change the numbers. This is why a smart contract is so important. A human is attempted to change the numbers. A human has to worry about finding more people. A human can be jailed by a governor and their books destroyed. A scheme that works on a blockchain, however, is impervious to all of these concerns, assuming it doesn't get hacked. A blockchain can always assure each participant that their policy is safe. Show them at any time how much they can expect to withdraw and how much liquidity the policy provider has. If, F, if P3D works, I imagine it becoming the premier provider of lending in the crypto space. Now, this is fascinating. You buy P3D when times are good, collect income from a few individuals who need to liquidate to pay rent, and know that they can always cash in your token and know that you can always cash in your tokens when you need to pay rent. Let's imagine an alternative to P3D. It's called Insurance DAO. It uses the same contract. However, it checks for approval of agent before a participant is allowed to sell. If insurance DAO is selling life insurance, its agency checks for the death of the individual. If insurance DAO is selling car insurance, its agency checks the recipient from the mechanic before allowing it to sell. If insurance DAO is selling medical insurance, the agent checks a hospital receipt before issuing a payment. Insurance DAO, DAOs can charge lower fees since it knows the risk of different contracts. It will survive based solely on the quality of its governance and UI. The openness of the smart contract is key for this. Now, I want to comment on this for a moment. What the author is saying is absolutely correct. <coughs> 
There is some building security because it's going to be centralized by an authority that makes the final approvals. However, I would prefer to self-insure through something like P3D if it was more stable and more widely adopted because I don't want an insurance company to tell me when I can and can't take anything out. However, like he says, it would create stability if not anyone could take out whenever they wanted to for any reason. So the, the, he makes a very fascinating point here. Because P3D always cha charges 10% and users have unlimited freedom to buy and sell, there's also more risk. That's correct. However, fees pay for this risk. That's also correct. A real insurance fund will have far lower fees but will be more restricted. P3D is a very good initial version of an insurance DAO because it requires no oracles. Why do I think it's a better store of value than Bitcoin? Bitcoin always requires there to be a greater fool to buy your asset. So if I stored value in Bitcoin and I need to get that value out, but the market is bad that day, I can receive far less than I put in, possibly even zero if everyone agreed that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. Compared to P3D, which collects Ethereum, the price of Ethereum is somewhat irrelevant to the contract itself. That's important to note, by the way. It's priced in Ethereum, but it's irrelevant to the actual contract. It only represents an on-ramp of value to the contract, much the way Bitcoin is valuable because it represents the on-ramp to the Bitcoin payment network. Think of Bitcoin as having PayPal credit. It has no worth if nobody accepts PayPal. In the future, an implementation that utilizes a stable coin like a DAI would be far more useful, especially in providing a sense of security to participants. This is garbage because this is requiring a little bit of centralization. I don't like that. Is P3D a game? Is it an insurance DO? Is it a Ponzi scheme? Is it a pyramid scheme? Will it be hacked? I currently do not know the answer to any of these, but I do know that people will immediately label it a fraud. This is absolutely perfect. But I do know that people will, many people will immediately label it a fraud since it is actually very threatening as a business model to large financial institutions. I mean, this cannot be overstated. This is it, folks. This is the ETH DAP that is going to make it big. P3D will demolish, these are his predictions, P3D will demolish the altcoin market, maybe. P3D will solidify ETH as the only smart contract platform that matters. P3D will lock up ETH, a lot of Ethereum and reduce liquidity in the market. I don't know if P3D is going to lock up Ethereum. Um, if it looks like it might be shut down, I can see a parallel market forming in Ethereum classic land. This has already happened. And if you come down here to the bottom, he says, this is good. Someone said on July 22nd, which was just, what, last week? Hey, man, just heard about P3D today. Bought a bunch and was reading more about it until I found your article here. Honestly, I can see your logic here. Wish I knew about it before. Anyways, since FOMO 3D is on and P3D is going up now, can I get your thoughts on the current situation and what you think will happen? I'm still reading about it. It will take me a long while to get to the bottom of this. His response is excellent. Hi, Slayer. I'm personally very long P3D as well as, and this is, an implementation of the same contract on Ethereum Classic. I went there, but there's absolutely nothing going on with that right now. I believe this model can be applied to companies creating... This is ingenious. He didn't mention this at all. He didn't mention this at all in the article. This is actually one of the better use cases, I believe. I believe this model can be applied to companies creating a smooth growth curve from creation. Imagine you launch a company by deploying a proof of weekends contract. You put up the initial capital and then get some investors to buy in early. You liquidate some of your first tokens to pay for startup costs. As company grows and makes dividends, you use those dividends to buy more tokens in the contract, kind of like a market maker. New investors can also choose to buy tokens and collect dividends whenever they want. The, there is never a need for any actual exchange or liquidity to event like an IPO or a Series A through Z of funding. Investment is open to all. No fears about opaque dilution. It also penalizes high-frequency traders by imposing a tax on them to long-term hodlers. Also, imagine voting rights. Early investors have greater control. This is so fascinating right here. Like, I read that and I thought, oh, I don't know what that was all about. I was trying to highlight it. I read that and was like, that is incredible. Incredible. I haven't even thought about funding. So, ladies and gentlemen, there you go. That's this incredible article. I'll try to link the article down below as long as I remember to do that. Um, but it is an incredible, incredible article. Quick recap, by the way, I'm going to put this in my last video that was very long. Crypto tab going along, you can see I've got a lot of referrals. I just did an advertising test that looked like it went very, very well. I'll be doing another one in the future. Um, I'm going to be notifying um, those on our Facebook group about what I'm doing. So if you want to join our passive Bitcoin community, just click the link below. Um, you'll get an email, confirm your email, and then you'll immediately get 
an invite to the Facebook group. So go ahead and click on that to get invited to the Facebook group and you will get notified um, here in a couple more weeks. I'm gonna run two or three more tests just to confirm my results. And then I will be showing you exactly what I've been doing. As you can see, this number has went up drastically. Um, I do get a little bit you know, from my YouTube and uh, a little bit from Twitter, but when I run advertising, it's obvious because I get kind of a huge rush or an onslaught of referrals um, you know, within a 24 hour period. So it's always obvious uh, what's happening. So stay tuned, hit that subscribe button, hit that thumbs up notification icon, and let me know what you think about this article. I love where he says there's a tax to traders. Um, I actually don't think P3D, I know people love to sell it because they see their money go up. Long term, as more Ethereum come into contract, I think that, that people are going to see less appreciation and value of the token just because at some point in the future, now I think we're a long way from this, there's just not enough people constantly coming in, but there will always be buyers and sellers. I think this token is personally, my opinion, is as best utilized as a long term hold strategy with very few selling unless you just absolutely needed the the money for some reason. So thank you so much for watching. Put your comments below. Hit that thumbs up icon. Subscribe. Let me know. Do you agree with me? Am I off base? What are your thoughts? Have an awesome day. Thank you so much for watching this video.